Bonjour et bienvenue, toutes et tous. Hello and welcome everyone. On behalf of the Institute on Effect Studies at the State University of New York, College at Pottsburg, I'm Amy Southerton, Assistant Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Celebron Quebec and to express appreciation for sponsorship of this opportunity by the Quebec Ministry of International Relations and La Francophonie, as well as the United States Department of Education, Innocent. In honor of March being the month of La Francophonie, the Institute on Quebec Studies has traditionally offered programming on the SUNY Plattsburgh campus to celebrate our commitment to learning about Quebec and its diverse cultures. In light of the pandemic, this year we are offering a Celebron Quebec lecture in a webinar format featuring Dr. Aaron Hurley. Thank you to all our virtual audience members for joining us for our first virtual rendition of Celebron Quebec. Although we are not together face to face, we appreciate your interest to gather together virtually and hope that each of you are well and taking good care. During our session, we welcome you to ask any questions at any time. Please submit your questions by locating the Q&A box on your screen. The Q&A box is where we ask you to submit any questions or comments to be addressed by panelists. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Kirky, Director of the Institute on Quebec Studies at the State University of New York, College at Pottsburgh, and President of the Association for Canadian Studies in the United States, who is moderating this session. Thank you, boss. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted that you're able to join us. Um, as Amy said, uh, uh, we are always thrilled every March when we do Celebron Quebec to focus on Quebec culture. Um, it's uh, a fundamental staple of what we do and what we believe in. And to that end, we're delighted to be joined by a friend and colleague of the Center and the Institute of Quebec Studies, Dr. Aaron Hurley from McGill by way of Owen Sound. Owen Sound, of course, being a lovely little community of about 21,000 that juts out on a peninsula of Georgian Bay. Great people live there or live there, came from there. Greatest painter in the history of Canada. Miss Teen Canada 1981, Heather Hiscox, lots of famous people. But all that being said, and hello to you, Penny. I know you're joining us this afternoon. Um, we are delighted, quite honestly, um, that we have Aaron with us. Aaron is going to be speaking to the title today of uh, Theatre Quebec, Why? And two musicals. We're delighted at this most inopportune time in the world of uh, COVID-19 pandemic to have such an exemplary scholar and friend speak to the issues of why culture matters in Quebec. What it what is the place of theater and to speak specifically to uh, the annals and importance of English language theater in Quebec. Uh, having said that, by way of background, um, Aaron is Professor of Theater Studies at McGill, past president of the Canadian Association for Theater Research. She's published widely um, in the areas of Quebec theater, national performance, affect theory and Canadian studies. Her most recent book uh, that came out with the Press de, de l'Université de Montréal, a poem, um, focuses on Quebec uh, contemporary theater, uh, Le Théâtre Contemporain au Québec. Um, her current research project is a critical history of English language drama and theater in Quebec uh, from 1930 to 2010. And with no further ado, we've been delighted. Aaron's been with us several times as our distinguished Fulbright Chair in Quebec Studies, amongst other things, and a good friend and a good supporter of our Institute on Quebec Studies. Aaron, thank you for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. And then at the end of your remarks, I'll come back and moderate a question period. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris and Amy for your invitation to present. I want to also give a shout out to Sharice Granger, who helped organize the technical stuff and everything for this presentation. Uh, happy day after International Women's Day and greetings from Chauchake or uh, Montreal. So I'm going to share my screen. This might take a couple of attempts uh, because when I start to play, okay, so hold on. It's all right, it's coming back, I promise. Let me do this again, there, and share. <gasps> Good, okay. Um, if anyone has problems seeing the slideshow, I'm just going to flip slides here um, or finds that I'm too soft or too loud or going too quickly or too slowly, 
please let um, Amy or Chris know um, in the chat or in the q and A. I I can't see the chat as I'm presenting, so I won't be able to address it directly, but they will give me the high sign and then I'll, I'll modify as needed. Um, so just to go back here, the title slide. So you might be saying to yourself, you know, um, why a talk about culture and specifically why theater and to be even more niche, why specifically English language theater in the French language province of Quebec? Um, you know, haven't you heard there's a global pandemic happening? Um, I have heard. Um, it's been very hard on the theater sector here as elsewhere. Um, and I guess, so the first thing I want to say in this talk, and it's, um, uh, it's a it's a cri de coeur, but it's also a way in to the material that I'll cover today is that culture matters. So I want to say culture matters and theater matters. Um, and I want to suggest that theater is consequential, um, even in a time of global pandemics and even if theater workers are not uh, necessarily putting needles in arms uh, with vaccines. This is not I say this not to diminish the really important work. Um, obviously, that's happening for those of the, for those people meeting the needs and uh, the health crisis in healthcare, for example, and social services. But it is to insist on, um, even in a time of global health crisis, it is to insist on the very real and felt significance of culture, um, particularly the live time-based performing arts, right? It is with some irony that I'm giving this talk uh, on a virtual platform and not in person, giving I'm speaking about uh, one of the, the quintessential live arts that requires the presence of, a, of uh, performers and a live audience. Um, the arts reflect and shape social imaginaries. They create conditions in which we can understand stand ourselves as a community, in which we can understand ourselves as humans. Um, science, thank goodness, will keep us alive, right? It will ultimately get us through this pandemic. Um, and I'm happy that the vaccines are rolling out um, and I wish they'd roll out even more quickly. But the arts um, give us reasons to continue living, right? They give us reasons for, um, for hope and for coming together. And I think this is particularly the case for those that we now colloquially call our most vulnerable, or at least this is language um, that's very common in Quebec now. Um, again, around the pandemic, but um, culture, as I say, is really important, especially for those who are most vulnerable, those whose marginalization societally because of their language or their race or their sexuality or their access to clean air or water, those whose marginalization um, creates obstacles to their flourishing. So I want to, in the rest of this talk, turn to another moment, another kind of health crisis, if you will. The moment is mid 20th century Montreal. And in this example, the health of which we're speaking is the health or, and the well being of a community of a minority language group, in this case, um, English language speakers in the majority French language uh, province of Quebec. So I'm going to focus on that minority language group and look at two different models for their flourishing um, through the theater, how those are expressed through the theater in a period of rapid and decisive political and demographic change for Anglophones in the province. So first, just quickly, a bit of context. Um, this is the book that uh, Chris was just talking about. So I was a collaborator on the book, which was um, authored primarily by Gilbert David, Hervé Gay, Hélène Jacques, and Yves Jubinville. Um, and this is the research group that I was a part of. So for this book, I contributed um, the history of English language theater in Quebec. All right, um, so just for context, English as a minority language in Quebec. So the Anglophone, sorry, I wanna go back. The Anglophone population reached its peak proportionally in Quebec, that is proportionally in relation to um, a French language speaking population. The data doesn't um, show indigenous populations. Um, so it reached its peak, uh, the earlier data, it reached its peak proportionally in 1851. So in 1851, 25% of people who were recorded in census recordings, 25% um, of the Quebec population who were recorded spoke English, right? And the other 75% spoke French. 
Since 1851, that proportionality has uh, steadily and significantly declined. So if we look at this, for example, is a census map uh, from 1971 of just Montreal, okay, which is um, historically into the present day, the sort of center of the English language population in Quebec. So the red dots reflect pockets of English language speakers. Now I'm going to flip in the next slide. So pick a point on this map and I'm gonna to flip to the next slide and this is 2006. So we're going from 1971 here to 2006. So you can see both the spread of English language populations, but also the thinning out of those dots, right? And this reflects the drop um, in English language population um, across just the 19, from 1971 to 2006. The most recent census from 2016 indicates that 13.7% of Quebec's population use English as their first official language. Again, Canada has two official languages, French and English. So 13.7% of Quebec's population use English as their first official language. So what's interesting to me about these numbers is that um, in the theater, the minority status of English language speakers, which has been consistent since settlement, right? The minority status of English language speakers is not necessarily reflected in the theater. It's not indeed English language speakers until about the mid or late seventies didn't perceive of themselves as minority language speakers, okay? Rather they thought of themselves in majority terms. So in English language theater in Quebec until about the 1970s, we don't see the need on the part of the English language population to express their distinctive local identity. They didn't understand themselves to have a distinctive or local identity. Um, the English language population does not uh, recall itself to itself, right? It doesn't engage in memory making through um, theater practices, which is something that I suggested the arts can do in times of crisis. Instead, we see, um, these are two programs from the mid-century. Instead, we see that the theater produces foreign um, plays from largely the States or from the UK. We get a lot of Shakespeare, right? So um, again, the presumptively greatest um, English language playwright and poet. Um, that continues to be the place, uh, the case in English language theater in Quebec. We still get a fair bit of Shakespeare. So this was a theater before 1970 that was not particularly local, was not particularly cognizant, right, of being English and a minority language speaker in a French speaking region. So it's not partic particularly local in that sense. But that's not to say that locals didn't participate in the theater. Indeed, they did and abundantly. The early years of my study from about 1930 to 1960 are replete, in fact, with amateur theatricals in churches and schools, on rented stages. So to give you just a couple of examples, um, the two major th theatrical successes in English in the 1940s come from homegrown amateur companies, which um, uh, formed by people issued from diaspora. So for its 1942 production of The Green Pastures, which was an American um, pastoral play, pageant play, like a musical play, the Negro Theatre Guild drew on the talents of the Union United Church of Montreal. Um, and this is a photo of at least part of the company. What we've learned is that um, this drama included more than 100 members of that church on stage, that the clubs that were formed around dance, music and drama at the church all came together to do this musical, which raised funds for a milk drive to, draw, to buy milk during the war, 1942, to buy milk for babies in England. So again, local production, distinctively local cast, foreign play from America, and the proceeds of this amateur production are going to England, they're going abroad, okay? So we see a bit the dynamic. Um, the second greatest, uh, most award-winning production of the 1940s is that of the Dybbuk by um, Anski. This is a classic of the Yiddish theater, and this was produced by the amateur company of the Young Men's and Young Women's Hebrew Association players in 1940. So um, 
as I say, locals did participate in the theater, but mostly producing foreign content. The historical record of this era before 1950 is really dominated by the Montreal Repertory Theater, uh, which came closest to having a professional status and produced an early who's who in Canadian theater. You might recognize some of these faces. This is Christopher Plummer in the Montreal Theater production of Jean Cocteau's um, Oedipus, The Infernal Machine. This uh, young man here in the top hat is William Shatner on the mountain um, in a Shakespeare play. This is Hume Cronin, and this is Amelia Hall. Oops, sorry about that. This is Amelia Hall. Um, all of them ended up at Stratford, indeed Stratford, um, the Shakespeare Festival in Ontario, founded in the 50s, pulled five of its 18 members of the first acting company from the Montreal Repertory Theatre. Right, so it tells you about the standards and also about the way that the Montreal Repertory Theatre really seeded Canadian theatre, right, um, germinated Canadian theatre. All right, so the Montreal Repertory Theatre. It's founded in 1929 by this indomitable lady, Martha Allen. I use lady um, specifically because she was the daughter of Lord and Lady Allen, um, so titled. Um, this quote about her is just great uh, to tell you a bit about her personality and her nonconformity. She was an ambulance driver in the war in France and she was wounded and then she comes back and she founds the Montreal Repertory Theater. Um, significantly for our purposes today, um, as interesting as Martha Allen's personal story is, is that her theater, the Montreal Repertory Theater, effectively contained a whole sort of theater sector um, in and of itself, it was the institutional infrastructure for English language theater and in part for French language theater at the time. Um, so it's founded in 1929, as I say, and it ran until 1961. So it had a 30 plus year run. So when I say it contained within itself a whole theater sector, here's what I mean. Here's where the elements. The Montreal Repertory Theater had a main stage theater a studio and French language theater. It had a lending library of plays and theater resources. It oversaw a school of theater and it owned its own theater space, which it loaned out to other smaller companies in town. So this set of sort of services, if you will, that the Montreal Repertory Theater provided reflects a sense of public duty that was attributed to the theater at the time, right? That um, the theater was going to um, help acculturate people. It was going to sort of uplift people spiritually, morally, educationally. Um, and it was a theater, the Montreal Repertory, Repertory Theater, whose public duty was also supported by the Anglophone elite of the period of which Martha Allen, again, daughter of Lord and Lady Allen, uh, was a part. So, for example, when uh, this is Ravenscrag, uh, this was her family home. Uh, now it's the Allen Memorial Institute aimed after her family, which is part of the, the McGill University Health Center. Um, and this, the picture on, well, on my right anyway, the smaller building, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, that is the stables, which had been emptied of horses and uh, which Martha Allen used to rehearse um, the first few seasons for the Montreal Repertory Theater. Okay. So she's a member of the Montreal elite. Um, this elite supports the English language theater at the time, both by showing up to the shows and paying for their season's tickets. And also by, for example, so when the MRT needed a tea set, right, a silver tea set to go in one of their plays, Burks would just send, Burks is the fancy um, jewelry store um, and silver house, they would just send a tea set over for use on the stage, which then the theater would return at the end of the run. All right, um, funny story about the Trinity Players, which is one of the amateur theaters at the time. Um, Mrs. Eric Molson, otherwise known as Hazel Molson, so of the beer and hockey Molsons, um, she was the board chair of the Trinity Players of this amateur theater in the 40s and 50s. And she jokes in a reminiscence about how she and her husband would attend the productions. And almost every time her husband would come away saying, 
gosh, how similar the set looks to, you know, things that they own. It looks so much like our living room. It's so lifelike. Well, of course, that was because Mrs. Eric Molson had basically brought the furniture from their family home and put it on the stage to make um, the set pieces, right, for the plays. So these are other ways that um, important families at the time supported the English language theater by attending it, by sponsoring it as angels, by loaning their furnishings and their tea sets. Okay, so despite all the borrowings and uh, the patronage, broadly speaking, English language theater in this pre-1970 period enacts a certain disposition, I would say, with respect to locality. So again, we have locals doing it. We have locals contributing to its um, success, right, especially financially and in terms of goods and services. But again, its content and its attitude, I would say, was not really invested in the local. I'm going to call that attitude a blithe attitude or a blithe disposition, a kind of nonchalance and um, non-interest in what was happening specifically around. So this blithe attitude with respect to local circumstances, right, especially the fact that Anglophones were, again, a linguistic minority in a majority French language population and culture, this blithe attitude is anchored in their sense of belonging to a supervening elsewhere, right, to English Canada, which exists outside of Quebec, but to which they are tethered, to the Commonwealth, right, the British Commonwealth, the kind of world organization that is um, international and metropolitan and shares a common language and a common culture. So again, in this time pre-1970, Anglophones are a demographic minority, but their sense of them of um, value and their sense of priority was definitely majoritarian, not minoritarian. And this continues to be true even into the 1960s, which is um, the beginning of an extended moment of rising nationalisms, both in English Canada and in predominantly French Quebec. Okay, here comes the musical part. I know some of you are students here for a class, so are here effectively under duress. So this is for you, the musical interlude. Okay, My Fur Lady. Here, My Fur Lady is the sole success of English language original drama so written by people in Quebec in English from the 1950s. It's a satirical musical comedy from 1957. And it skewered the quest for a Canadian cultural identity, which was being taken very seriously at the time, okay? So as you might recall, 1957 is also the year in which the Canada Council for the Arts was established. And it begins dispersing funds to professional theater artists across the country. And so it's really a watershed year, 57, in the institutionalization of something we can now call Canadian theater. But this Canada Council for the Arts, of course, it doesn't happen out of nowhere in 1957. Um, it's a major recommendation of a federal commission called the Nash Massey Commission, which starts in 1949. And this is a commission on Canadian culture and identity. And the Massey Commission, I want to read you a couple of quotes from the Massey Commission, because you'll hear them echoed then in the satirical um, songs of My Fur Lady, which I'm going to play for you in just a moment. So the Massey Commission understood itself to be, quote, concerned with nothing less than the spiritual foundations of our national life. The commissioners set out to search for what can make our country great and what can make it one, end quote. Here referring to the linguistic plurality of Canada. So such a sentiment is then teased, the sentiment from the Massey Commission, which leads to the founding of the Canada Council for the Arts, right? This sentiment is teased in Teach Me How to Think Canadian, a song from My Fur Lady, in which the lyrics read as follows on your slide. Every other country has tradition by the mile. If you're gonna be a nation, you've got to have a style. You've got to have a unique constitution. You've got to make a unique contribution. You've got to express yourself in literature and art. And on the international scene, you've got to play a part. Okay. I will note that My Fair Lady, um, this musical satire of Canadian culture and politics was written, produced and performed 
by undergraduate students at McGill. Um, I say that proudly as a McGill professor. Uh, the conceit for the show's parodic expose of Canada's lack of national distinction, right? It's saying we don't have a culture, we're just gonna have to make it up. Um, so the, the conceit, the beginning of the story is that um, an Inuit princess, bear with me, an Inuit princess arrives in the nation's capital of Ottawa. Her name is Aurora Borealis, right? You can hear the comedy already, I hope. Um, and she is the princess of the fictional Arctic island of Makluko. Um, and she's in pursuit of a husband because according to the laws of her home country, she uh, must be married by the time she's 21 in order to preserve the independence of her country from Canada, okay? So again, you see the displacement, I hope, of the Quebec question onto an indigenous character from the North, right? Um, so Aurora Borealis comes to Ottawa. She's introduced to Canada's culture by the members of the Culturality Squad here on your screen now. Um, she makes stops in Parliament. She learns about uh, Canadian politics at a cabinet meeting. She learns about social graces and music at a debutante ball. And she attends courses in poetry at McGill. Now, as this is a musical comedy, it goes without saying, of course, that the princess falls in love with the governor general. So again, the British crown's representative in Canada. So not, right, Canadian in that um, sort of located way, but a representative of a foreign power. All right, so to be clear, um, to preserve the sovereignty of her home country, Makluko, Princess Aurora has to surrender her personal sovereignty to marriage and chooses to do so with the most obvious of Canada's colonial vestiges, the governor general, okay? Um, here is a bit of the governor general's song in which he describes his job. What do I do? Lily, I'm in a dictating mood. Get me my hat. Oh, I feel a song coming on. <laughs> You're Gigi. Thank you, Lily, my dear. I'm ready. From Victoria to Gander, I tend to vice regalities. To quote Lord Alexander, I govern generalities. It's part of the vice regal game to tour municipalities. At every stop, I must proclaim the same polite banalities. Charming, delightful, beautiful, frightful. Okay. The song goes on. I hope you could hear the resonances with Gilbert and Sullivan, right? In the musical idiom and also in the kind of rhyming scheme that's being deployed. Um, this is consistent with the rest of the musical idiom in the in the in My Fur Lady. So this the influences come either again from Britain in the form of musical, uh, excuse me, in the form of operetta and Gilbert and Sullivan, or from the United States. So again, foreign influences. Um, it combines 1940s sentimentality, 1950s rock, and various elements of jazz. So this is a very funny and clever musical. It was hugely successful. It made almost a million dollars in 1957 for its student producers. It tours across the country, 82 cities. Um, at the same time, it wasn't particularly standing up for Canadian culture, right? It was rather, it wasn't expressing a Canadian identity either. It was rather sort of snubbing its nose at that whole enterprise. All right. On, um, so some of this snubbing is of course a privilege of status. If you understand yourself to be part of a, of a dominant group economically, socially, linguistically in a larger sphere, that being English Canada, um, you don't have to pay particular attention to what's happening directly around you. The fact that you're living in a Francophone culture with a majority of population that by the way is, um, assuming its power and assuming its majority status come the 1960s. So as they say, what goes up must come down. And that happens with um, Anglophone uh, peoples, the Anglophone community, and with English language theater after 1970. So that's the change I'm gonna chart now through another musical. So significantly, uh, what we now call colloquially the Anglophone community, 
by which I mean an entity that's organized around language instead of around faith or around origin. The Anglophone community as a concept only emerges in the 60s and 70s, and it does so um, in a period and precisely in response to the quiet revolution, right, and the rise of Quebec's secular bureaucratic French speaking state. Okay. It also is consolidated um, in response to legislation making French the public sphere. These include the Official Languages Act, for example, of 1974, which makes French the official language of Quebec, the Charter of the French Language in 1977, which mandates immigrants into French language school, again, to make the public sphere more French, to make that the language, the vehicular language, the language that people use in public spaces. Sociologists and geographers stipulate that these language policies, and here I'm quoting, they resulted in English speakers transitioning from their identification with Canada's English speaking majority to becoming a language minority within the predominantly Francophone province." End quote. So this felt experience of being a minority is compounded further by Anglophone Quebecers out migration, they're leaving Quebec, and by the group's absolute demographic decline. So this is sort of the shocking statistic from um, Ronald Rudin, the historian. Okay, so paradoxically, perhaps the Anglophone community, one, becomes the Anglophone community, and two, gains an identity that's more firmly rooted in its minoritarian status in the province of Quebec, at the same time that its status, its demographics, and its institutional support are made significantly more fragile. So one example of this reality adjustment that Anglophones undergo during this period can be found in the 1984 musical comedy, Anglo! Exclamation point, a musical cartoon. Like My Fair Lady, Anglo is another hugely successful satirical musical on nationalist policies and national politics. It ran consistently from 1984 to 1986, that's two years, in Montreal. But this time, the nationalism at issue in Anglo is not an English Canadian one, how do we find an English Canadian identity when we don't have one, but rather a Franco Quebecois one and English, English language people's response to it. So Anglo's narrative structure, its plot again mimics My Fair Lady. A stranger comes to town and has to learn about their new surroundings, but instead of an Inuit princess, this time in Anglo, it's one Bob Smith who arrives from an unspecified location in English Canada at the Montreal train station where he's greeted in the show's opening scene by a new colleague as follows. Jeanne extends her hand and says, Bienvenue, welcome to Montreal. Jeanne Tremblay, séparatiste. And Bob shakes the hand back and says, Bob Smith, Capricorn. Here is a bit of that song. And then there are several verses after this as well. So here then is our friendly but clueless protagonist, Bob, who offers his astrological sign, right, as a significant identity marker in response to Jeanne's declaration of her stance on Quebec independence from Canada, séparatiste. Bob's initial blitheness, right, which recalls that from Anglo, in 1957, his initial blitheness to his new circumstances is slowly overcome across nine songs and 26 scenes during which he learns the proverbial rules of engagement for an Anglophone in Montreal's work environments, public spaces, social worlds, and cultural venues. For instance, human resources at his place of work schools him in Anglo hegemony. His colleague, teaches him how to stay under the radar as an Anglophone. So for instance, he's first counseled to pretend to be a deaf mute so that he never has to speak English, right? So no one will ever know that he's secretly an Anglophone. Um, 
Then his colleague advises him, and I'm quoting here, to go ethnic. Some minority group, especially one oppressed by the English, you know, like Gaelic speaking Scots, end quote. Okay, so again, um, covering up his Anglo hegemonic um, identity base. Although his French teacher teaches him how to order de hot dog all dressed in good Quebecois French, which there is clearly just English with a French accent, a bad fake French accent. Um, the Office de la Langue Française arrests him for improper pronoun usage and then later releases him because he proves that he knows how to conjugate in the passé simple, which is a notoriously difficult verb tense. It's the literary verb tense. Okay, so Anglo, like my fur lady, also cheeky, funny, very clever, um, musically eclectic, sort of skits vaudeville style. But Anglo also differs really importantly from my fur lady, and this is my this is my last point. We're coming to the end. Um, it differs in its specific and local address. Right, my fur lady is very much a Canadian musical. Um, it's set in the nation's capital. Its references are to things like the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, and it jokes about American cultural imperial imperialism. These point to the national Anglo-Canadian address. On the other hand, Anglo courts an Anglo-Montreal audience quite specifically. For instance, the second scene features Bob trying to find the Metro. This is a recurring gag throughout the show. And in each instance, Bob discovers new complexities to such a seemingly simple act of wayfinding. This first time, the particular complexity lies in the francisation, uh, the francisation of Montreal's toponymy since the 1970s, where English language street names are replaced with French language ones. Thus, an Anglophone couple guide him to the Metro along streets that no longer exist, right? Like they no longer carry their old names. For a true newcomer like Bob, this change right, is invisible because he never knew the old street names. He's arrived and everything has been um, renamed in French with French words. But for longer term Montreal inhabitants who are the audience of Anglo, right? The joke speaks directly to their own reorientation in their urban space. All right, um, just so I don't leave you hanging about Bob's uh, fate in Montreal, he does successfully navigate his way to a metro station uh, and by using his increasingly good French. Um, and when he gets there, he's confronted with a mechanic strike, so he still can't take the metro, which is kind of a classic Montreal joke, even now, it turns out. Um, in the end, however, Bob, like Princess Aurora before him, encourages um, Princess Aurora, she encourages her people to accept Canada, to join Canada. Bob um, elects to stay in Montreal. All right. So for, oops, sorry. Um, the Anglo-Quebec community's sense of itself, its sense of its minority status then shifts over time. And we see the theater really charting that shift, expressing that shift, working through that shift, right? Um, and that shift is one in which they become more local um, and complicated. So these two musical satires show the dawning recognition of such a minority status. My Fur Ladies, where My Fur Ladies light comic fodder, right? We have nothing distinctive. We have no identity to express. It doesn't matter because we're part of this larger commonwealth. One period's light comic fodder becomes another's bitter rejoinder, right? Where in Anglo, here we have the school songs for sale, a key means by which we might cultivate identity in the educational sector is closing, right? So the lyrics, you can charge it on your MasterCard, they're dirt cheap as a rule, so don't be the last one on your block to buy yourself a public school. This of course has come true um, as English language schools continue to close and uh, developers are buying them for, to make condos. Out of them. Okay. So even in this tension though, Anglo, um, Anglo, the musical, concretely um, establishes the active presence of minority English language speakers, right? So it's doing the work that I um, indicated at the very top of this talk, I think theater can do that is so fundamental, um, that is so foundational to culture. 
So it is establishing the active presence of minority English language speakers. It's reflecting on that community's collective memory, right, in the example of the street names. And it fosters group cohesion through that um, collective memory, but also through resentment, right, a kind of politics of resentment that runs through this, through humor, through nostalgia. Together, these activities, establishing the presence of that community, reflecting on its co collective memory, fostering group cohesion, these can buttress a community and inculcate a sense of belonging. Post-1970, such a belonging necessarily happens alongside a French language majority. And so I wanna leave you with the duet, Mixed Marriage, this is from Anglo 1984, a romantic hymn to bilingual, bicultural relations. And then it repeats. I want to thank you all for your attention and for coming. And I will happily um, take questions or comments or reflections or however you would like to proceed. <laughs> yeah, Bob totally settled in the West Island, <laughs> Mike Thompson. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Aaron, very much. I'm going to throw some questions out for your uh, observation and comments. Sure. Um, um, in no particular order, um, can you, um, English language theater, mm -hmm. based on the examples that you've gone over this afternoon, particularly in Montreal, is clearly focused on identity. That seems to be the constant or principal theme that you spoke to, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. you know, satirical and it's audible focused or right. that focused. Um, does that continue to be the case in terms of English language productions now that, that pop up? Um, is it very identity focused? Is it satirical in nature? What are we seeing? Uh, okay, so two comments. First, um, the examples I've chosen are certainly identity focused. Um, it's significant. So My Fair Lady is significant, not only for its success, not only for its um, musical satire format, but also because it's, I want to say, one of three original plays written by Quebecers in English before 1970 that has anything to do with Quebec or Canada. So it's actually, so yes, it's identity focused by saying it's not identity focused, right? By mocking the kind of identity quest. Um, but in that it is an outlier okay. okay so this is part of the um the point about blitheness there isn't much that actually does that post 1970 yes we get many more plays that have something to do with identity now often um often especially in the 70s the plays are about identity but they're not necessarily about an anglo-quebec identity right so they're about um women's identity right why? It's the era of, of women's lib, as we used to say. Um, it's about sexual identity. It's about um, racial identity. So it's about other forms of identity, obviously, that can intersect 
in the way that identities do with a linguistic identity, but most of the plays are not actually about linguistic identity. The exception to that rule, and it's a big one because it's the play that people tend to know if they know um, things about English language theater in Quebec, is the 1979 production of David Fenario's Balconville, which is uh, Canada's first bilingual play. It's set in Point St. Charles, which is an historically working class district in Montreal. And it's about um, French language and English language neighbors and uh, sort of the politics thereof, right? Um, so yes, after the 70s, we see more plays that have to do with identity broadly. It's not free, it's still not frequently about an Anglo-Quebec identity. Um, and then the, the most sort of current turn, uh, a more recent turn, I would say since the 90s, where we see a lot of solo performance. Um, again, a focus on identity, but also especially on identities that the focus on the kind of bilingual, bicultural, like that mixed marriage song, right? Um, or the two solitudes metaphor, the kind of identities that are missed in that bilingual bicultural model, which are racialized identities, which are immigrant identities, which are diaspora identities, right? Allophone identities. Um, so people who, allophones being those who speak uh, in the Canadian context, neither French nor English as their, as their first tongue. So we see plays by, for example, Lorena Gale about um, being a black Montrealer, uh, black English speaking Montrealer. I have four additional inquiries for you okay. here. Um, can you um, give everybody who's who joined in today um, a question, a sense of um, what was the state of English language theater in contemporary Montreal on the cusp of the outbreak of uh, COVID-19? Oh. How healthy was it? Was it was it really being performed in church basements, or was there a, was there a, was it right. part of the Montreal you know cultural scene? Right. Um, okay. So before the outbreak of the pandemic, um, so the pandemic interrupted one, two. Sorry, I'm just counting three. At least three professional English language productions that come to me just off the top of my head. Um, there would have been more at some of the intermediate um, sort of semi-professional or independent theater venues as well. So it's, it, I would say the, the contemporary English language scene like right now, right now, uh, or in the past two years um, is very active. It's quite eclectic in its forms, in its um, style, in the genres that it performs in. Um, some, so amateur theater has, I mean, it continues. Uh, so for example, there's the West Island um, Operetta Society. I'm getting that name wrong, I'm sorry. Um, there are some church-based amateur companies, but the, the, the whole notion of theater being something that people just do in their spare time, um, you know, has kind of gone by the wayside here as it has everywhere else. It used to be something that one just did. Right, um, and we see that in the mid-century, and that's not so much true anymore. The English language theater scene in Montreal or in Quebec now does have an infrastructure which it did not have before. So we have Playwrights Workshop Montreal, a playwright center. We have publishing houses, one in Quebec and two in the rest of Canada that publish uh, the plays by English language Quebec playwrights. Um, we have the uh, Playwrights Workshop Montreal I mentioned, we have the Quebec Drama Federation, which is kind of a, a service organization for English language theater. We have training programs at the colleges and at universities and in conservatories. So there is an infrastructure to English language theater that sort of mimics in miniature because of the smaller number of people, the smaller population, it mimics in miniature the French language theater scene, which is incredibly um, supported and incredibly in comparison with the English one, again, because of size, elaborate, uh, supported and elaborated in its structures. Um, yeah, and English and French theater scenes had, had somewhat different responses to the pandemic, which I can speak sure. to briefly if that's of interest. Should I continue? Okay, so um, everyone stopped for a little bit when the pandemic hit on March 12th, and we were told that everyone had to go home and not touch anyone um, or breathe on anyone. So 
what most of the major institutional, so those are institutional theaters. So these are theaters that have multi-year funding for their organization that allows them to keep operating, right? So not punctual project-based funding. They may also have that, but they have longer term funding. Those institutional theaters, um, almost to a one, went to a, um, an in-house workshop model. So if they were in the process of creation, so building new shows, whether those shows were written or were from the were new plays, whether they were plays from the repertoire or whether they were creations, right, which are built in production, are built through rehearsal, um, they brought them in house. So obviously this is small teams of artists would then come together and continue to work on the shows. The idea being that once we're allowed to open again, these shows will be almost ready to go and you can put them up and we have a, and also again, because those theaters have ongoing funding, it was a way to keep paying the artists, Sure. right? Um, right. Yeah. Because that creative process is absolutely a part of their, of their work. The English language theaters, um, did some different things. So theater Tableau d'Hôte, which despite its name is an English language theater um, in town, an independent theater, it did um, a serial production. So parts of a story across several weeks, one per week on a specific night um, outside in different parts of the city. So it was site specific. So you'd just show up and it was free. Um, Likewise, uh, the Centaur Theatre, for example, which is one of the major English language theatres here an institutional theatre, it did a thing called the Portico Project, where it invited um, emerging creators um, and sort of more avant-garde creators to do short pieces on the portico of their theatre. So again, outside, and you would stand across the street in the parking lot, socially distanced, to watch these pieces. Um, and then, of course... Yeah. How's, the, how's the health of the Centaur Theatre, by the way, uh, you know, pre-pandemic and all that? Yeah, it's still going. It has a relatively new artistic director, Ida Holmes, who came from the Shaw Festival in Ontario. Um, so she's brought in, um, she's continued with writers and residents, sort of resurrected that program and um, uh, given it a bit more support. Okay. Um, so the current writer in residence is Michaela Cesare. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it has its regular winter seasons. Um, it's interrupted now. It's been less active in COVID times um, than what I might have expected. It's partnered with the Tarragon Theater in Toronto to do some audio work. Um, it did do most recently their Wild Side Festival, which obviously was all online and tends again to be young emerging work. So that seems to be where the focus of the theater is in pandemic times is again, getting money out to artists, supporting especially young slash emerging slash new artists. Thank you. We have an inquiry um, from a colleague who wants to know, how was uh, the production Anglo received by French theater critics? And if you can provide a little context for that, Erin. Oh, yeah. Um, so there isn't much French language criticism on Anglo in the, in the papers. Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the first is the form or genre of the show. It is a review, right? It's a musical review. So it's a series of skits. And uh, I mean, again, there's a story about Bob who comes from somewhere in Canada, probably Ontario, um, but, it, but it's fairly loosely organized. It's also, it was done as dinner theater at a place called Le Stage, uh, classic sort of Montreal, let's just put a French article and an English word together. And, <laughs> you know, that will be that. So it was done at Le Stage for those two years running. Um, and dinner theater um, tends to be by, by academics and by critics, tends to be viewed because it's more popular, because it comes with food um, as less meritorious. Sure. Um, and so less interesting to be reviewed. So, there, so that would be one reason why there are fewer uh, reviews. Interestingly, the way I came to find out about this show in the first instance was through um, the journal, the theater journal of record, um, called Je, Cahier de Théâtre, where the French language um, critics 
talked about it because it had been running for so long. And they cited it as an example of, again, of dinner theater as this is something that the English people are doing that as like a feature of the theater scene. And it had never crossed my mind that dinner theater was a feature of the English language theater scene. But for those couple of years, there were about five of them, six of them, six years that is in the 1980s, dinner theater was in fact a thing as, as we say. Um, for English language theater that was not done in the same way in French language theater. Here, here's a question for you. Um, you know, um, a lot of what we've what you've spoke about today has been focused on satire yep. for English language theatrical productions go, but it's it suggests to me. Um, can you speak to are there any significant representations or examples? of English language theater that have looked at Quebec society from a very critical standpoint, from a drama standpoint, where you can see where there's, there's a ton of space in a literary world right now for plays that, be, that could be easily constructed around an immigrant family who moves to Quebec, right. who is right. shocked to discover that the province has moved in a direction most recently under the government of Pauline Marois and, and Francois Legault and, and have promoted the French language, but yet they're wherever. Um, they could be in uh -huh. Townsville or they could be in um, Magog and they're struggling and they're seeking, you know, and, and it's just a different reality. Is there anybody who's really Mm -hmm. who, who, who's really from the English language community tackled those really tough questions? Yes. Um, not always. Like, an Edward, like, an, you know, like an Edward Albee, somebody who really takes a real, cuts to the core, you know, really gets to the heart of the issue, social issues, instead of yeah. sort of just making light of them, you know. Right, right. Um, so, Yes, the person and the company that does that most expressly and directly and consistently um, is the playwright Rahul Varma, who's also the artistic director of Tisri Dunya, which um, means third world in Hindi. And it is a theater that was founded in 1981. It started as a theater producing in South Asian languages um, and then moved to English language production. It has done some bilingual English, French and some exclusively French language production, although it is um, overall an English language theater. So Varma along with Stephen Orloff, who is also uh, uh, an English language Montrealer, um, co-wrote a play, for example, in the mid eighties called Counter Offense, um, which was about police violence against racialized minorities, against black men in Montreal um, and arose out of a very, out of a specific incident. Actually, it would have been after 1987 because it rose out of a specific incident of police violence um, and the death of a young black man. So yes, um, that's just one example. Rahul has written other plays about um, some issues uh, have to do directly with things happening in Montreal or in Quebec. Um, and some which are broadly, his is a socially activist theater, um, some which has to do more broadly with, for example, themes of genocide or domestic violence. Um, so he produced a play by Carmen Aguirre called The Refugee Hotel. She's um, a Chilean in Vancouver, Canadian naturalized citizen um, who wrote about um, political dissidents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was staged at Tisri Dunya. So he probably takes it on most forcefully. Stephen Orlov, who I mentioned was a co-author of Counter Offense, um, wrote a play that was staged at the Centaur in the early 2000s, 2002 maybe, um, called Freeze, which was about um, the ice storm in 98. So again, a very specific event and uses it as a way to, um, it's like in television, we call them bottle episodes, right? Where you put a bunch of people in a room and they can't leave for some external condition. Well, in this case, it's the ice storm. And so it's this real, um, very eclectic group of people. And it's a bit of a social experiment to see how, not just the two solitudes, but like 
uh, how do you introduce what's often called the third solitude, which are um, Jewish Montrealers, Jewish Quebecers. So the third solitude plus uh, racial minorities, plus et cetera, et cetera, and put them all in a house during an ice storm. So there are some, it's less common. I would say the, the comic approach is more common. Marianne Ackerman has written a couple of plays about living in a triplex in Mile End um, and gentrification. Right, which is a real issue for artists in Montreal. I don't mean to make light of it at all. Um, David Fenario, Balconville, he did a follow-up in the early 2000s called Condoville, which was again about gentrification in the point, right? So what do you do as working class people or people with fewer means when a bunch of yuppies come into your neighborhood and jack up the prices, prices right? Yeah. So yes, there are, there are, um, okay. yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a... Another question to throw your way, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. is uh, one of our participants today is interested in learning what the current state of English language theater in Sherbrooke is. Yeah, and, and in the oh. town, more broadly. Yeah. Uh, how okay. healthy, how robust, how anemic is it? Uh, it's, I would not say it is robust. I would say, I mean, right, cultural production relies on audiences and so it follows populations and so as the English language the English speaking population has atrophied in especially the regions of Quebec um, it has on the one hand concentrated in Montreal so people will move from the regions to Montreal to access English language services like healthcare, especially right um, and the people who don't leave the regions, English speakers, um, it's been shown, um, demographers have done this work. Um, the English language speakers who stay in the regions, as you probably know, tend to be um, retirement age or they're very young children, okay? So not working people generally. So they have, demographers call it the missing middle, which is working age people, right? So adults, 18 to 55, let's say. Um, and those people are a core theater audience, right? They're a core constituency. And so um, theater does less well in places where that audience doesn't really exist or doesn't, isn't thriving, right? To put it in the terms of my talk, where their well being is threatened. So, in the townships specifically, the townships have historically been a really strong basin of English language theater. I wrote an article about it actually for Chris <laughs> in the Journal of Eastern Township Studies. Um, so from the 1930s until 1982 or so, there were at least two summer theaters in the Eastern Townships that were vibrant um, and that were populated and that attracted professional and amateur um, actors and artists. Um, since the mid 80s, uh, there are still some summer theaters. Uh, there are no professional winter theaters in the townships. Um, there are summer theaters. Uh, they have gone largely um, to comedy, like stand up comedy, to producing, to presenting stand up comedy, and to presenting music. So they've become kind of roadhouses, right? So they're not producing their own content and they're producing less and less theater, less and less drama. Um, we could see this happen too at the Centennial Theater, which is the theater on the campus of Bishops, Bishops University in Sherbrooke, where again, it was used for between 1971 and 1982 for a festival, an annual festival in the summer of Canadian plays mounted professionally um, by David Rittenhouse among others. Um, and then after that period, it too becomes a roadhouse, which it always was. It was always welcoming large productions, dance pieces, uh, music, concerts and stuff from elsewhere, but it turns really exclusively to that. So we see that sort of modeled in mini miniature in the repertoire of the Centennial Theater at Bishops. Um, so there's the Hudson, oh, Hudson's not in the Eastern Township, sorry. There's, um, Oh, what's that? There's Theatre Lac Brome, which is mostly music and comedy. There's um, The Piggery, uh, which was for a long time a big summer house and now is also mostly music and comedy. Those are the two I can think of in the townships. And the Centennial has closed, which you might know, it closed about yeah. five years ago. 
Thank you, Aaron. Um, with that, I'm going to ask everybody to join me in thanking Dr. Hurley for a wonderful tour of why culture and theater matters and sort of the state and the development of English language theater in Montreal, Quebec. Aaron, thank you very much. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks for your thank good you questions and comments. I appreciate your, your time. And I'm going to turn it over to my boss now, Amy, please. Well, I'm going to turn it over to the audience to ask them for some feedback by launching an evaluation poll. And um, mm. you should see four questions on your screen. We'd love your feedback so we can learn from our audience as well. But I want to thank Erin, especially, as well as Chris, for our time together. And thanks to everyone who joined us virtually for the webinar. Thank you. Um, two upcoming events I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one is the ninth annual Quebec Past and Present Colloquium that the Institute on Quebec Studies at SUNY Plattsburgh is organizing collaboratively with the Eastern Townships Resource Center at Pitsup University. And it's taking place this Friday, all day, March 12th, as well as half day on Saturday, March 13th. So I'm just putting the link in here and you can actually register for that and attend virtually as uh, a participant. So look forward to your participation there. And then on Monday, the 22nd of March, the Institute on Quebec Studies at SUNY Plattsburgh is hosting the Distinguished Quebec Address featuring keynote speaker, Dr. Stefan Pekan, who will present on after the crisis, Quebec international strategies post COVID. And I've gone ahead and put that registration link uh, in the chat as well. So we hope you will enjoy the rest of your day in safety and wellness. And thank you so much. Merci et au revoir.